Theater Writer Guy is telling you to ditch standard song forms as you write your musicals. And here's why. Standard song forms are great. They give us tried and true ways to write plot and develop characters and to write succinct. But they aren't always the most interesting forms, are they? Especially when all the songs in a show seem to follow the same formula time and time again. But luckily, there are plenty of other non-standard ways to write and structure a song for musical theater that we've seen work over and over again. In fact, a very large portion of the musical theater canon is made up of non-standard song forms. So today, let's talk about those non-standard song forms, or at least a few of them. By non-standard, I mean they are not 32 bar courses, they are not verse chorus pop form, and they are not a standard musical scene. But I will say that as we take a look today, you will probably recognize that there are elements of the standard song forms that are borrowed heavily to create these non-standard forms. I actually would not be surprised if a lot of these songs started out in some way at the standard form and then through experimentation they became something slightly different or vastly different. But the main thing to remember my friends is this, no matter what the song form is, if it works, it works. And whatever works to tell your story is valid, period. All right, let's look at some non-standard form examples. Starting closer to form, let's begin with a little Lerner and Lowe. Now Lerner and Lowe had this thing that they did a lot, which was they took a 32 bar chorus-ish, and then they sh just changed part of it. A little, a little zhuzhing. One of my favorite examples of this from the Lerner and Lowe song book, if you will, is from Camelot, the song Simple Joys of Maidenhood, which has this long verse section that's kind of doing all of these different things that feel like we're gonna go into a song, but then never actually amount to a song. There's some underscored scene work, and then we do finally arrive at our song moment at the end of this section. But, it's non-standard. It feels like it's gonna be an A, A, B, A, 32 bar chorus. And honestly, the A sections really are a great example of A sections for a 32 bar chorus. If you're not familiar, it's that, Where are the simple joys of maidenhood? Where are all those adoring, daring boys? Where's the knight pining so for me? He leaps to death in woe for me. Oh, where are a maiden simple joys? Eight bars. It's a great A section. Then we do another one. Then we get to where the B should be, but we don't do an eight bar B. In fact, we do this. Shall I not be on a pedestal, worshiped and competed for? Not be carried off for better still, start a little war. Four bars, with very fast words. I do wonder why, but it works. So, should we question it? Probably not, it's fine. Next, let's take a look at a more modern example from Beauty and the Beast. In fact, we're going to look at the song Beauty and the Beast. Now this one is a weird one because it feels like we're doing something musical theater, but also the pop version of the tune also feels like a pop song. What are we doing? What is this structure? So at the risk of a copyright strike, here we go. Tale as old as time. As it can be, barely even friends, and somebody bends unexpectedly. And that feels like an A section, right? Like we're about to go do another A section, and we do kind of start one. Just a little change. Small to say the then we have a change here and we're not doing the same thing again. So is this like an A prime now? Is that what we're doing? I'm both a little scared and neither one prepared. Beauty and the beast. And then we finally get our hook too. Is it an A and an A prime? And then we go and we do an interlude and then we just go back and do another A and A prime. Is that the structure of the song? Or are we looking more micro? Is the first half of the thing that I called the A section actually the A? And then we're developing into like a B, and then we're coming back to that A, and then we're ending with a C that has the hook? I don't know. And does it matter? Or does it just work? Oh, let's talk a little bit about Andrew Lloyd Webber. Webber has a structure that he uses a lot, which I guess I would call something along the lines of A, A, B, C for the structure of each section. And it works for the most part. 
whenever we see it. This happens a whole lot in The Phantom of the Opera, so I chose a song from Phantom. Think of me, think of me, think of me fondly when we said goodbye. Remember me, second A question mark, every so often promise me you'll try. B section? On that day, that not so distant day, when you were far away and free. And then, it's not quite a return, so is it a C? If you ever find a moment, spare a thought for me. I don't know. But it feels like a complete thing unto itself that we're gonna do over and over again throughout the whole song, which is really more of a sequence. And it works. Now let's take a look at a weird one from one of my own musicals, The King's Legacy. Now I didn't actually write it this way on purpose and didn't even analyze the structure until last year at some point to figure out why this song works so well. But there is a musical sequence called Mistress Anne and we have three song sequences here. Each of them is 32 bars, but it is not a standard 32 bar form. In fact, the best I could describe it is probably something like a, an intro, an A, another A, a B, and an outro? Question mark? Where the intro and the outro have the hook? Hard to say. We have this idea of mind, attend, follow, mistress Anne. That's our intro, that's our hook. And then we get some A material. I like her lively fashion, it's quite smart, it's unique. It's a game, but if she wants his notice, that's the key we shall see, wee oui, wee. Oui. There's three voices here, I can't actually sing all of it. But then we need to do another A section here. The king, he values beauty, love and art are sweet. Mrs. Lady, tri her tricks remind me greatly, dear of you. I actually don't know all the sections of this because it each changed slightly. Then we get our B question mark. Wait, will he wait? Still he waits. And he did. Outro. So mind, attend, follow, mistress Anne. I don't know. But it does feel like a complete little package, and it works. In fact, it works really well, to the point where in the premiere production, a lot of the audience members say that that was their favorite song in the whole show. It works. Before we take a look at some Sondheim examples, and he is kind of the master of the non-standard song form, I did want to let you know that I will be soon releasing a new video course about songwriting in musical theater. We will, in that course, be going very deep on a lot of these topics and taking time with each of these songs, as well as some other songs, and we will be hitting all the major pillars and foundations of songwriting across the musical theater genre. So keep an eye out for that, and if you want to be on the announcement list, make sure you sign up for my email list by clicking the link in the description below. Plus you'll get some free tips by doing so. Okay, famously, Stephen Sondheim tried to move away from using 32 bar choruses whenever he possibly could, because he found them to be a little bit repetitive and kind of boring. Not that he didn't use them, in fact he wrote some really brilliant 32 bar chorus songs. But a lot of the canon of Stephen Sondheim is non-standard song forms. We could really look at the entirety of his body of work to pick out different songs for examples, but let's briefly chat about three of them. Sticking a little closer to Tried True Song Form for a moment here, we have A Weekend of the Country, the act one finale sequence from A Little Night Music. Now, I can't actually play this, so I'm not even gonna attempt. This is a score reduction I have in front of me. But we have these different sections. The whole thing feels a little bit like it's verse chorus, but really kind of like a verse pre-chorus chorus sort of feel, where all of these sections have catchy music, but also where the chorus itself is a 32 bar chorus. What? Huh? Is it because we have a lot of plot work and character work happening? Probably, but we have like, for our verse material, if you will, look, ma'am, an invitation here, ma'am, delivered by hand, and ma'am, you notice the shit, right, that whole thing. And then we get into a little bit of transitionary into what feels almost like a pre-chorus moment. This, uh, what do you think? Who can it be? Even think? No, here, let me. 
Your presence, just think of it, Pedro, is kindly and it's at a chateau requested. Right, and that's leading us forward into something else, which is why it kind of functions like a pre-chorus does in a pop song. Then we end up with our main theme, our chorus moment, which is a 32-bar chorus when we get to a weekend in the country, we're invited. What a horrible plot. A weekend in the country, I'm excited. No, you're not, right? That whole thing is actually a lovely 32-bar chorus. So what is the structure of this song? Well, I don't know, it's a big old sequence, but you can kind of look at it as a combination of 32 bar and verse chorus, which is neat. Now, we'll not go in too depth about this next one, but The Steps of the Palace, or excuse me, On the Steps of the Palace, From Into the Woods, is a song that feels very narrative in structure, right? Like it's the stream of consciousness moment, which makes perfect sense for what's happening in the show for Cinderella at that moment. But it does actually have a structure to it. What that structure is, I'm not exactly sure. But it kind of introduces us to the moment with the music that happens whenever Cinderella is coming on stage running from the prince in a ball. Where we have that... We've heard this before already in the show by the time that this song rolls around. That's where we start. But then that begins to modulate into this... Which kind of transitions us into the song proper with the... Right? And that's where we get a sense of the structure of the song within the song moment. And how you break that down? Well, you can look at the score and take a look for yourself. It's something akin to an A, an A prime, a B, and an A double prime that then goes back to this transition to take us to this. Right, so we're kind of getting into the song through familiar means, doing the song proper, which is stream of consciousness, but with a pseudo structure and then pulling back out. Very neat. And the last one I'll mention for today is The Worst Pies in London from Sweeney Todd, which is really just going back and forth between this pattery stuff, which is giving a lot of storytelling and the moment where we get the, the release into, these are probably the worst pies in London. And each of these has kind of their own mini structure within them, but we get patter, we get our worst pie section, we get more patter, we go back to our worst pie section, and then we end with something that's slightly different and not the hook at all with times is hard, times is hard. But it works! Why? Because Sondheim's a genius. And that's just a little taste of what Sondheim does with his non-standard song forms. It's worth the study, for sure. Take his score, sit down with them. And all of this, of course, is also not to mention the great variety that comes when you start pulling in musical scene work as well. Now, of course, you may be wondering how you can infuse these non-standard song forms into your musicals. Like, where exactly do you even start to try to go down this road? And I personally think that it starts by mastering the standard song forms first. And if you want to go down that journey, then you can watch this video next. Otherwise, thank you all for being here with me today, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers!